Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Fraser King. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, August, what is it, 9th? 9th, 2013. Yes, it is. Uh, so this week, one year since Curiosity landed on Mars. Uh, we're going to talk about the upcoming Perseids meteor shower. Uh, Lori Garver has uh, left NASA. The upcoming flippination of the sun's magnetic field. Uh, the Japanese HDV4 has docked with the International Space Station. The Kilanova uh, update on the MAVEN mission and uh, launch of a Delta IV. So, uh, joining me this week, a crack team of space journalists uh, and or astronomers and or astronomy journalists. So, uh, we've got Sandy Springman from Arecibo Observatory, which I know, Sandy, once again, you've got to duck out pretty quick, right? I, well, it turns out the vet is open tomorrow, but yes. If, okay. Do whatever you want to do. Time. If you want to hang out, <laughs> yak with us, Yay. that's fine. If you want to go and ha and take cats to vets, that is also fine. Whatever you want to do. If any of you want to take home a genuine radar cat, we will discuss that later. <laughs> Does this cat have any superpowers? Um, it is really cute and Adorableness. Fluffy. All right. Mm. Amy Shear Title from Vintage Space. Hello. Moving on. Casey Dreyer from the Planetary Society. Hi, and I would add space advocate, too, not just space journalist. I'm totally biased. Do I have to add? So hold on. So I've got astronomers. <laughs> I've got astronomy journalists. I've got journalists. I've got space advocates. I've got astronomy advocates. I can be really annoying and make you call me an historian as well. Space, <laughs> space historians, historian journalists. Yeah, right. I'm also. I'm also. You've already got educator. enough names, Amy. All right, uh, David Dickinson. Hey, I'm just a puny human science. Puny writer, human so science writers. That's it. No. That's a category in itself. All right, and Nicole Gallucci. Hello. A noisy astronomer. All right, so uh, the big news here, I think, is, uh, well, it's not really news, but it's been a year since the Curiosity landed on uh, on Mars, and woohoo! Yay! Yay! <laughs> we were, and so we, we did this sort of a little show of hands before. Everyone who was present at NASA when the uh, when the landing happened, uh, put up their hand. <laughs> yeah. I was so there. <laughs> Amy was there. Uh, so so last year, I don't know if you caught this. We were still sort of doing these live Google Plus Hangouts, and people could call you. You can do anything but for the Curiosity landing, and, and I hadn't really hadn't occurred to me. And so then peer pressure. So we put something together, and and then I think at some point, Amy said, I'd like to get involved. And I think I said, Amy, do you want to go to NASA and report yeah, from there? Yeah, this was like a week before. Yeah. I, I was in Phoenix at the time. I was like, well, I could, I could drive to Pasadena. Sure, I'll go. So. So, we, so we got her access to NASA, and she was there and reported live. And it was, you know, it was a phenomenal experience. So, so one year on the red planet. So uh, Amy, why don't you give us a sort of an update on, uh, on what's happened? Yeah. Um, so there's been, I mean, I'm sort of not actually surprised that it's been such a good mission so far because, you know, these NASA guys design these missions to answer specific questions and they design them to work. Um, so a few of the stats that I have on hand about what we've done from Curiosity so far is it's actually sent back 190 gigabytes of data already, returned more than, more than 70,000 pictures, which is a lot of pictures considering how few seem to show up on Twitter, um, and has fired its laser, I like this, 75,000 times. Um, that's a lot of laser analysis. But what the science in that means is that Curiosity is actually a Accomplished its primary mission already, and that's pretty mm -hmm. neat. So, so this rover, unlike the previous ones, um, we're sort of you know building on our shore of knowledge on Mars here. So the the Viking landers in '76 didn't find life, so we kind of went to a step back and just you know sent sent a um, gosh sojourner in '97 to look around, and then Spirit and Opportunity were sort of roping geologists, cracking rocks, and looking at the sort of geologic history. And now Curiosity is the chemist, and Curiosity is trying to look for um, signs of, in the environment that show you know it might have been possible that life could have lived in that environment. And it's already found that yes, <laughs> um, the ancient Martian environment was one that could have supported life. So that's that's kind of neat and, and we've already hit that big science goal. So yay, now we're just on like extra fun time. Um, so of course uh, Curiosity's main target has always been um, Mount Shark, which is in the middle of Gale Crater where the rover landed. So now that now that we've done all the, the sort of science and little bits and pieces around where, where we landed, um, 
now now the drive happens to get to this mountain where there's all kinds of different strata of rock showing that we can read and sort of figure out what's happened and sort of look at the, the history of Mars in this sort of exposed rock layer. Um, so so that's going to happen. We're going to drive, we're going to go on our little Martian plutonium-powered road trip to a mountain. <laughs> Uh, so, has there been any problems with the rover so far this year? Um, I think the, I think the biggest problem was right. I should know this better off the top of my head. But I think the biggest problem was right after landing. Remember, we we saw the the pictures of the surface, and it looked like there were sort of burn marks where the retro rockets from the the descent module would actually kind of you know the the rover fell from this descent module on a tether, where the rockets from this rover had actually come close enough to the ground to kick up some material, and some of the rocks and junk had landed on the deck of the rover, and apparently something had smashed a wind instrument. Um, so that that failed. So I think that's probably the biggest failure on this so far. Well, there was also the uh, Sol 200 computer anomaly. That oh, was the right, when it, when it, um, I can't remember exactly what but, happened when you're planning to what exactly that, happened? <laughs> well, uh, they, they think a cosmic ray came and, and flipped a bit and corrupted one of the memory um, areas on the right. curi on Curiosity's A-side computer. Because it went and to a backup computer. They had to switch while. to its backup computer, um, and still running on the backup computer. They 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 they're not entirely sure what happened on the A side computer, but this is why NASA builds backups and backups and backups of things. Yeah. And so as, they, as they say, took it out, and it was scary, but I think it's okay. Ever yeah. since then. I was gonna say that doesn't feel like as much of a failure because like they build these backups for a reason. <laughs> so, you know, if it, they both failed, that would have been bad. But this is sort of like. Did it interrupt science operations enough to really cause problems? Because I feel yeah. like the the science community knew it happened, but it wasn't like headline news like the landing was. It wasn't sort of big enough to stop everything. Yeah, I think the the pace of the mission has been relatively slow so far, mainly because you know I, I kind of liken curiosity to human babies when they're born. You know, babies aren't fully developed when they're born, and it takes another year or so for the brain to finish you know growing and their the skull to fuse. And curiosity when it landed, they didn't really know how to run a giant rover on the surface of Mars. They they were gonna figure it out on the ground. And so they've spent many, many months just going very carefully through, this is we, how we move the arm, this is how we do this observation and that observation. And so when the SOL 200 anomaly hit, I mean, they, they weren't really like in this huge science phase anyway. I think they freaked out and they, cl they shut everything down for a week or two. Um, but uh, again, as you said, they, they flipped over and they were able to resume and then the engineers could kind of debug the other computer. But I remember talking to a JPL engineer saying, like, look, what you're doing is you're, you're effectively switching over to this backup computer by this... Uh, the, the rover was frozen in the middle of a command, and they weren't sure that it, it even would have known to warm itself at night with its battery. They were worried that it was going to run down its battery at night. And so they, you have to set a reset... Imagine setting a reset command 200 million miles away and hoping it works because you can't go over and move, you know, unplug the cord and plug it back in. So that's it was a engineers love this kind of stuff, but it, and it was disruptive. But again, as you said, they build these things so well that it worked and it's doing okay now. So I mean, I would say that in the last year or even leading up to it, I think NASA really had a a PR coup. They did a great job of getting the word out and giving the rover personality and and even on all of the following stuff. So I know, Casey, you watched this sort of how this relates to the budget. What impact has the sort of success of Curiosity had to NASA's overall budget, science budget plans, things like that? <laughs> Ironic, actually. <laughs> um, well, here's the thing. So we have this next major rover mission. It's called, the, right now, uh, aptly named the 2020 rover, which will launch in 2020, uh, which is basically a Curiosity clone. I'm pretty sure you, we wouldn't see this mission on the books if Curiosity hadn't been successful. Uh, you've seen what's happening with NASA right now. It's kind of flat to decreasing budgets based on the sequester. However, within it, the, amount, the part of NASA that does all the planetary missions, including Mars, has been going down. No one knows why, considering the success of Curiosity. So they've, they've kind of, NASA tried to hedge it and say, all right, the total budget for planetary science will go down, but we'll, we'll make sure that the Mars budget kind of stays okay so we can say there's the next couple major missions to Mars. This, again, this is why you see this future one. So despite Curiosity's major success, the overall NASA capability to explore the solar system is decreasing. 
that's just the way Washington works, I guess, sometimes. Uh, but Mars program is doing okay. Uh, the 2020 rover, next major mission, you also have MAVEN, which we'll talk about later. It's an orbiter launching uh, this year. You have, uh, in 2016, you'll have a lander that'll go and probe the geothermal environment of uh, Mars. And then you have the major European missions, Trace Gas Orbiter and ExoMars for 2016, 2018, which NASA has instruments on, uh, but isn't running themselves. I think uh, I think India is launching an orbiter this fall sometime yes. too. Yeah, Mars sorry. Orbiter. Yeah, yeah it's there's two Mom. going this cycle. Yeah, Mars Orbiter mission or MOM. Uh, that's yeah. correct. Yeah, there's so we... two for this 26 month cycle that are hitting. Oh, we got a question here from. Trying to make the trip. Got a question from the. Uh... From yes. the various places. One we have time. a question uh, from Hugo Berman asking, what is MSL's actual mission time? In other words, is there a planned end date for the mission in, in the way that Spirit and Opportunity were only planned to be there for, for three months? I think it's... How, what's MSL's actual plan? Do they have an end date, or are they just get, uh, keep rolling? It's, it's the, primary mission is two years, right? Okay. The one Martian and, year, about two yeah. or three years. Okay. Um, but it's got this... this um, radioactive new, core. I was going to say, that can go for a while. It's got, I think it's got 14 years of power in it, the amount of plutonium that it has on board, so it, it could theoretically go that long. I mean, I'm sure instruments will start to die off and it'll, sure. you know, capabilities will be limited, but at some point um, it's got power for longer. So it's halfway through its primary mission then? Yes. Okay. And has yeah, already completed that. its science goals. <laughs> So what the, then is going to be the next big milestone that we should expect from Curiosity in the upcoming years? Mount Sharp. Anybody? No. Mount Sharp. Mount Sharp. Yeah. Mount Sharp. Getting, yeah. getting to the yeah. mountain. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think and a lot of people are. They see along the way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you know, I I like to give Emily a hard time about this, and I ask this question again and again, which is, you know, not ask a question, I know the answer, but the fact that it's really not designed to look for life, that, that the rover is not equipped to look for life, this is the kind of thing that it might do with the 2020 mission. But they're definitely still moving towards looking for these environments that supported life. They've already hit Pater once. The more of these kinds of spots they can find, the more this evidence just builds and builds and builds. So. And so the major thing, uh, let me just toss in there with the, the major scientific things that they're going to be looking for at Mount Sharp. What's unique about Mount Sharp is they said the stratification of rock layers. Yes. And the, the age of that, it spreads through this history, the entire history of Mars, they think. And so what what's interesting to it as a geologist is that looking at the change from the point in Mars' history when it was wet and warm relatively to the dry kind of barren area it is now, seeing that change in the rock layers is what they want to explore. And that's what Mount Sharp will tell them, and that's what we've never had the chance to look at before. That's going to be the really, truly exciting part of this mission that's going to just tell us stuff we have no other way to get. All right, well, we could talk about this all day and <laughs> uh, and probably still after the show, but why don't we move on? So the big thing, and, and I mentioned this in Twitter, I think, the Perseids meteor shower is my Christmas. I get, I get so yeah, excited. I count the sleeps. Um, and so now we're down to like what two more sleeps until the Perseids? Well, I've been watching every morning though, and they've they're starting to become active already. So it's mm -hmm. worth if you've got clear skies, I would start watching like Saturday morning, Sunday morning. Morning is always AM is always the best time to watch for the. So I, I get to open my presents early. Yeah. Oh, yeah. definitely, definitely. And the several P days. Oh, Sandy, you're you're muted. I muted you earlier. It's more like Hanukkah. Yeah. You get several days of presents. Oh, do you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the, and they just get the, better the and better as the days go on. Yeah. The peak for the shower comes around. Uh, the peak for the shower comes around August 12th. This uh, Perseids are usually noted for having a twin peak. Uh, the first peak, interestingly, around 13 uh, 1300 Universal Time, may favor Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast. So, actually, Fraser, you may have a, uh, a front row seat on the morning of the 12th for the first peak of the Perseids. I'm uh, I'm all over this. And Sandy, do you have any plans to track it? Uh, we were. I I might head out someplace early on uh, Sunday morning to go see it. I'm on a really weird observing schedule from radar. Uh, we've been waking up at like three and then going to bed at seven. But then we um, we might have something went wrong with one of our receivers. But that's okay. It'll get fixed. Uh, but the reason this meteor shower is so exciting um, is that the source of the meteor is Comet Swift Tuttle. It had a huge yes. nucleus. It was about 16 miles, 26 kilometers across. That's really big. So it has all these this debris left 
along its orbit, and the Earth goes through that once a year, and so you get these really spectacular fireballs. So this is why it's yeah, Christmas Swift. for Fraser. Swift Tuttle came by in the early 90s, and we saw 92? enhanced rates. Yeah, we saw enhanced rates then in the 90s. We Usually this one produces a zenithal hourly rate about 60 to 100, but we were seeing about 200 per hour in uh, the 1990s. And, and there's been a few years where it's peaked a little, like 2004, 2005. There's been enhanced peaks. So 200 is pretty respectable. All right, we've got, we got another a, question here. Yeah, this question uh, about the Perseids. In what direction or star sign in the sky should I look? The, the radiant comes from the constellation Perseus near uh, Cassiopeia and Hercules and in that region, but it rises right around 1 to 2 a.m. For It depends what your latitude is, where you're observing from. Most northern hemisphere observers, if you're around 30 to 40 degrees north, it's going to be above the northeastern horizon. However, you will see meteors in any part of the sky. That doesn't yeah. mean they're just going to be in that radiant. You may That's see them falling behind you or off. I've heard people say to look 45 degrees off to either side of the radiant. I tend to look just like wherever I can in the sky. I just, I just get a blanket and lie down. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm going to be doing here uh, at the campus observatory It's just providing, you know, blankets and chairs and just telling people look. It's good. Just look at the whole if sky. You can have, if you can have several observers and everybody look off in different directions, you can kind of get a whole sky coverage. And there are people that actually, you know, real data is still being... Uh, being utilized by people just going out and counting how many meteors they see per hour and submitting the data. Uh, so then you're saying early morning. Uh, we also have a question, when does it come around? Well, when does this come around every early, year and what's a good time it, to look? It, it comes around right around August 12th. Uh, the, the Perseids have a nickname of the Tears of St. Lawrence because uh, St. Lawrence was martyred, I believe it was in the 4th century in Rome, right around the same time of year, on August 10th. And, and the, they will say the meteors were the tears of that saint, if you think about the mythology behind the whole shower and things like that. Okay. So right around August, I would start watching, though, people are already seeing them now. So mm -hmm. I would keep watching every morning up until the 12th or 13th around that time because you can see them. And, and if you get clouded out those days, you might want to watch the day before or the day after just in case. That's yeah, I think the the day. most important thing it's not about like what you see that night and how you you know where you look and so on. It's how you set yourself up. I mean, you want to go and find a place that's going to have some nice dark skies, and that in many cases yeah. might mean for a lot of folks driving for a couple of hours to go to a place that's going to have a really nice a really nice view. Uh, someone from Chicago emailed me and they're like, "Where should I go?" And then I looked at the dark sky finder for their area, and they literally have to drive two hours in yeah. as far yeah, away from harder. the city it's yeah to even get yeah. the kind of skies that I have here and so I Rest. can drive for half an hour and go to completely dark skies so mm -hmm. it's a it's really rough I mean with the dark skies but that's it I mean if you can go and get yourself to a place that's dark where you can see that Milky Way you can see the you know and then you've got a nice <clears throat> position that you can look up at the sky then that's really there's nothing else what's, to it people ask cool me you know What's oh, cool ahead. this year is uh, the moon reaches first quarter on the 14th, so first quarter moon will have set by the time the meteor shower is active in the morning. So we don't have the moon to contend with. When it's a full moon during the meteor shower, it, it cuts down the zenithal hourly rate dramatically. When you're saying zenithal hourly rate, that's an ideal rate. That's from a perfect dark sky site, like you were saying. That's being able to observe with the radiant straight overhead, which really nobody has. Radiance usually at an angle, so, so some of the meteors are coming down over the horizon where you don't see them. It's uh, There's a lot of things that can cut down that zenithal hourly rate. So most people probably won't see that 60 to 100, but if you're seeing them come every few minutes, that's still pretty cool. So you might see an actual observed rate more like 30 or 40 per hour from a location. So there you go. You got two more days. Sunday, well, go watch it every morning now. Watch it uh, every night, and then Sunday morning, really go watch it. So you know the discussions come around too about audible meteors. I want to bring this up because I saw this yes. on another news site, and I touched on that very briefly on my post too. It's a big. There's been a big controversy over whether you can actually hear meteors, and what it is, you're not hearing it through the vacuum of. of of the atmosphere because they're occurring too high up, but they can actually set up uh, an electrophonic current that can actually, uh, aurora can do this too. There's been actually reports of people hearing aurora as crackling or hissing type noises. I've, I've seen one meteor one time that produced this kind of effect, but it's an interesting thing to just keep your ears out for. But what you can do is use a radio tuned uh, not to a station, tuned in yes. between stations, 
and uh, the uh, the ion trail that it creates uh, allows you to hear more distant stations, and so you can actually hear the effect that um, that yeah. a meteor has if you're using a radio. I think I mentioned that briefly on the article too. Yeah, there's there's a whole link to how to listen for FM meteors. It's kind of an interesting thing to do. That's really cool. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on, though. Uh, so you actually put this on the docket, Casey, which was uh, Lori Garver leaving NASA. What? What? <laughs> so just to recap, because I'm sure everyone you know, already knows the administrative hierarchy of NASA, uh, Lori Garver is the deputy administrator. She's the second in command right beneath uh, Charles Bolden uh, at NASA. She's a political appointee. She was approved by the Senate back in 2009. Uh, Longtime space you know, person in the space world is now voluntarily leaving NASA. No, no scandal. No, no, nothing negative. Most likely, she's just burnt out because working in a political position in NASA, fighting for your own pet projects against everyone else's pet projects, can be somewhat exhausting. So she's actually leaving, going to the Airline Pilots Association. Okay, so she's going to be taking off. It's going to open up this new role, who's going to be the next deputy administrator of NASA? Who's going to be pushing for their programs or NASA's programs or the president's priorities? It's a powerful position. could make a big difference in certain areas, um, but it's hard to say exactly who that person is going to be yet. There's space news is rushed with speculation. They're tossing out <laughs> names left and right. Um, any person that the president will have to nominate has to be approved by the Senate. If anyone's been following politics in the U.S. lately, that is not a pleasant, quick, or capable process right now. It's not working very well. So it's a question. President Obama may not even bother to put another deputy administrator in NASA. It's the last two years of the administration. There's not big new initiatives coming up. It's not necessarily a given. Uh, Dan Golden, who was a previous NASA administrator, never had a deputy. So it's, it's not a necessary requirement. Um, also, at the same time, NASA's chief financial officer is leaving at this, uh, as well. These are the, some of the top two positions in NASA, uh, and that means a lot of internal mucking around and also, you know, if a lot of N NASA initiatives can be left to drift or pursued more strongly, kind of depending on the personalities that come in. I speculate in my blog, what does this mean for the asteroid retrieval mission? Um, I think it means it's a bad thing. I think Lori Garver was pushing very hard for this mission. Her absence is most likely going to be felt I don't know if Bolden is going to push that with the same ferocity. So again, big changes at the top of NASA mean different priorities will, will kind of shuffle out, and we'll just have to wait and see what happens with that. Kind of came as a shock to at least us in the science writing community. It just kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of people are thinking that you know what we're getting to is about two years before the next presidential uh uh, race in the U.S., and she very closely was aligned with Hillary Clinton back yes. in 2008, and this may be pulling away, recharging batteries, kind of getting ready to run with yes. uh, Hillary in, in 2016, so yes. that's part of this. It's kind of scary to me we're already talking about another presidential election. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's what starts to happen, and you'll start to see that more and more in the presidential administration as people kind of see the writing on the wall. Do they want to run it out, or do they want to get out, recharge, and start working for the next time around, maybe be positioned more highly? Yeah, and I mean, you, in many cases, I mean, when a person finally does leave their position, they've known they've wanted to, to do this for a long time. I mean, it's been, you know, I'm sure it's been months, possibly even a year in the making of just like whatever policies she's wanting to push forward just aren't happening or political issues or, or future plans, whatever. I mean, this all unfolds behind the scenes very slowly, and uh, and so and now we're all finding out about it now, but it's all been worked out, figured out, next positions planned, and probably even replacements found. Absolutely, and again, we shouldn't dismiss how exhausting her job is. I mean, she's the deputy is classically the political appointment, like very, the, very much the the flag holder for the politics of the current president. And so going up against a very hostile Congress, trying to they tried to cancel the Constellation program. We ended up with the Space Launch System. They have the commercial crew, which she pushed very hard and worked very hard to change the culture in NASA to support commercialization of low Earth orbit rockets into space and people. Those are exhausting things to do. I can just see she would just be, I'm good enough. I need to go to sleep at you know a reasonable hour nowadays and, and that call it a day. 
Well, good luck, Lori, with whatever you work on next. Hey, uh, I've got a couple questions back from the Perseids story. I just wanted to bring that up... old story? That old oh, thing. Those boring uh, things. M23 <laughs> wants to know, are the Perseids a threat to the ISS? Does no. anyone know offhand? Is they just too small? Mm, mm, they never had those kind. Of, I, I know during the Leonids back in 98, 99, when they were very intense, they angled yeah. some of the satellites to kind of... I know they shielded the Hubble in order to protect it, but I, I've never heard of any uh, major threat from the, the Perseids. That occurs every year. Okay, a couple, ISS, anyway. couple people are reporting they've seen fireballs. Uh, Very cool. And Bill Christian uh, says, asteroid alert just discovered 48 hours ago. 2003 yes. PF-13, yep. whizzing by Earth at only 0.5 lunar distances. Yeah, I, did, I actually saw that last night on Space Weather when it came up. Awesome. Please observe. Awesome. Please All observe. kinds of please things. <laughs> yes, please observe it because <laughs> Sandy broke our SIBO. Large, and yeah. we wouldn't be able to see it anyway because the three sigma pointing, it's just it's just not good enough for us to do it. Goldstone might be able to do it, but it's hard for them to get time on weekends because they have to go ask a general for permission. He's usually out playing golf. Even if David sends a tweet. <laughs> I, I did tweet about it last night. Yeah. Uh, he, if, he can't, if he can't come and get us some new six thousand dollar low noise amplifiers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Twitter's more tw Twitter's more like a stream, and if you just happen to see the information fly by, and then you catch if it. it so. If you know if the telescope's <laughs> working, we are all over yeah. it. We will take we will take requests. We have to take uh, requests from planetary uh, resources. Michael Jobin says, "Put Emily in that seat." I guess uh, Michael is referencing uh, a deputy director. I don't know. <laughs> Emily Lakdawalla is the deputy director of NASA. I think she's she not a politics Michael. person. <laughs> <laughs> she's not a politics person, but she sure knows her stuff. I think yep. she, she would. Uh, she does. She can do anything. I guess, so we could just put her in, give her any job. That'd be fine. I'll pass uh, that along. Uh, okay, well, let's move on. So let's talk about the Kilonova. I love Kilonova. the name. Kilonova. We, we all just want to say Kilonova. Kilonova. <laughs> what is it? What is what is the story? What, is it going to kill us, this Kilonova? No. it's A Kilonova is something between a Nova and a Supernova. So it's like a medium-sized Nova thing. So this is tied to a gamma ray burst that was discovered back in June by the Swift satellite. So there are two types of gamma ray bursts. There are short duration gamma ray bursts. They last for only a second or less or a few seconds. Uh, really high energy intense and um, for a very long time uh, astronomers had an idea of what could be causing them but weren't actually sure. Um, they tended to happen in galaxies that had older populations of stars. They don't have young stars that tend to go big supernova. Uh, and so uh, it was a question as to what caused these gamma ray bursts. Um, for a long time, they thought it would be a merger of, of uh, compact objects, so two compact objects such as neutron stars, so these, you know, these, these, these dense balls of neutrons that are left over after a star has gone supernova, uh, two of them spiraling, spiraling, spiraling around each other and finally collide, giving off this immense burst of energy. And so this was the idea, and they had predicted they would see something on the scale of a kilonova, but it hadn't actually been detected yet. And so after this, um, this gamma ray burst, it was on June 3rd, it was discovered by the Swift satellite. Again, it lasted for last, less than a second. This is what the Swift satellite has helped us do over the past eight years, is detect and get data on these gamma ray bursts as they're happening. Um, they followed it up with a Hubble Space Telescope about 10 days later, and looked at this galaxy. Let's see if I can bring the picture up while I'm while I'm yapping. Uh, they looked at this galaxy and saw a little brightness that wasn't there before. So luckily they had previous pictures of the galaxy. So here's the galaxy. Here on June 13th, there's this little brightening that hadn't been seen before. They observed uh, again a little bit later and it dimmed down. And so this tiny little brightening here was what was left of the neutron star explosion, this kilonova explosion. And it turns out it matched predictions really well. It gave off a little bit of optical light and a lot more infrared, just as they expected to see. Uh, and so this is the first, um, first time they've actually seen what has caused a short duration gamma ray burst. And so this is a big deal, the fact that they were able to follow it up with Hubble so quickly. 
So now we have, what do we have? We have uh, Kilanova, so we have Nova, Kilanova, Supernova, Hypernova. Hypernova, <laughs> yes. Kilanova is the coolest. So there was also a hypernova in the uh, in the news this week. This was a long duration gamma ray burst. Now we've long I did that segue just for you. Yes, this is perfect. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> so this was a uh, a let's see a longer duration gamma ray burst, which we think uh, we've now uh, they tend to cause in galaxies that have younger stellar populations. And so these are the results of a hypernova, a a really 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 supermassive new new. Uh, supernova explosion that actually obliterates the entire star. Um, and so this is the furthest yet that they've seen. It's 12.7 billion li uh, light years away. Um, and uh, th they've been calling it a, uh, a galaxy in the Dark Ages, and that's not technically correct. I would say uh, the Dark Ages is the, er are the, is the era before the galaxies turned on when it was just hydrogen gas. But this is still in the Epic of Reionization era. This is when first galaxies, um, they're still cl uh, ionizing all the hydrogen gas in between them. This is a, a period of time we don't know as much about. And so because this brightened so much um, and we were able to see this, this gamma ray burst so distant so far away, they could actually tell um, some of the chemical elements that are in that galaxy that they otherwise couldn't have seen because it's so distant. And so they figured out its metallicity. Remember where I'm using the term metals to mean anything heavier than hydrogen, helium, and lithium. Um, the, the old school We're version. made of metal. We're made of metals, yeah. uh, but it's about We're a tenth. Everything else. <laughs> it's about a tenth of uh, the amount of metallicity of our sun, and so there's not quite enough heavy elements uh, to be forming planets and life and, and things like that. But this is, you know, the first billion years of the universe's existence. So uh, I, I, it's the most distant to date. Of course, we're always finding more distant things. But what's interesting is that it lit up that galaxy so that we could see what it was made of. Awesome. Now, speaking of the sun, uh, Amy, you've been reporting on this. Focus, Amy, here it comes. Uh, the sun's magnetic field is about to flip. Why won't it flip already? When's it going to happen? Uh, next couple months, and you're not going to feel a thing. Um, this is really, <laughs> really neat. So I, I, um, I mean, people who, you know, deal with this stuff probably know that the sun is not actually just a solid ball of light in the sky. It's, you know, it's coronal mass ejections and sunspots, and it's all very dynamic and wonderful and lovely. But it also has a magnetic field. There's there's material inside the core of the... Or I, it doesn't really have a core, properly speaking, but there's material inside the sun that actually generates a magnetic field, and that magnetic field flips midway through every solar cycle, which is about every 11 years. Um, and that's about to happen. Um... So the neatest thing that I learned, actually, because I've never heard about this before when I was writing this article, um, is that there's this thing called a current sheet that is is this sort of, I, I kind of imagine it basically like like when you're making a bed and you're you know pulling the sheet taut over the mattress, that it's this sheet um, kind of emanating in the right from the center of the sun going out throughout the, the solar system. And it's around that sheet that the heliosphere, the sun's magnetic field, exerts its, its sort of influence and it's kind of made around, I guess, and sort of envisioning a bubble around a sheet. Um, so when the sun's um, magnetic field flips, the material inside the sun starts to reorganize. And first first one of the poles will lose its its polarity. That's a terrible way to say it. But one of the poles will sort of change its, its sign. And then it basically waits for the other one to catch up. And it'll also sort of, the charge will fade. They'll both go to zero. And then they'll reemerge um, magnetically charged in the opposite direction. So north will be south and south will be north. But up will still be down and down. Or, you know. um, so what happens with that sheet is that that, that sheet ripples. Um, and that's really neat, but we're not going to see it. I don't know. Are there any ast astronomers yeah. there? Can we see this sheet, like, doing something? The, the um, northern hemisphere has pretty much already lost its polarity yeah. right now. I was talking to a so researcher today about a similar article. There was a so terrible report done. on Fox News, if anybody saw that, about that corona hole where the scientists <laughs> said that a did, chunk of the sun did, had blown did, off and was headed towards Earth. That's Did you see we, we we missed a we missed a Carrington event that went around the news too that actually never occurred too. There was a, a lot of news 
uh, uh, back in 19 or 1859, I believe there was a big solar flare that's known as the Carrington event that uh, was one of the biggest solar flares ever seen. And for some reason or another, the the news cycle picked up that we had just narrowly missed one last week, but it never actually happened. Space right. Weather actually had to put a fact check on their site saying because they got so many uh, so many calls about it. We narrowly missed something not happening. Yeah, basically. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, this this is definitely going to happen, but there's nothing to really narrowly miss. Um, yeah, it's it's gonna it's gonna flip, and it does it all the time, and it's not gonna be very interesting for those of us who don't spend all of our lives thinking and dealing with the sun. Um, that that sheet, that current sheet, it does have some effect in terms of like protecting the Earth from um, cosmic radiation that comes in. So as it kind of ruffles a little bit, it'll change something in the way that cosmic rays reach the Earth, or better yet, don't reach the Earth, but we're really not going to notice a difference, so don't say anything, Fox News. Uh, don't say anything. <laughs> we, got, we got a question from uh, Simon Fincher. Is the yeah. Earth's magnetic field going to flip anytime soon? Uh, isn't it yes within the next 200,000 years or so? Soon on geologic time scale? Soon, scales? yeah. 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 Soon. Like, that's what it happened. It does it every... 100,000 to 5 million years. Like and it's happened you know. when there were humans living on Earth and there does not seem to be any record of it actually affecting them. So yeah, it's not nearly I mean, as explosive yeah. as it happens yeah. on the sun. Again, if, if you go on YouTube, which I do not recommend, even though you're probably watching this on <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> Did he, we just lose Did his we audio? Just lose? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. It's not just me. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, we have a question from Hugo Bernman. Uh, how do we measure the sun's magnetic polarity on Earth? Do we use the SDO? And I know SDO has a magnetogram on it, uh, which allows us to see magnetic activity. Are there other, anyone else know of how we're measuring that? There's also the gong, the gong network that monitors the sun 24-7. I know they have a magnetic component with that as well. Okay. And SDO. And so Can you guys hear me now? And, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There you are. <laughs> yeah. The, the image I'm the microphone. The image I'm sharing right now is the sun I took from my backyard here just a few hours ago, and you can see how actually inactive it is right now. There's one little tiny sunspot on it right now, so it's very weird that you wouldn't know we're at solar maximum right now by looking at the sunspot. No. It's been a very strange cycle. It's the it's the quiet before the storm. Yeah, they say there may be a second peak. Uh, there, there was a peak back in 2011, early 2012, and uh, they, they don't know if that second peak is going to come around or not. Uh, okay. Next next up here, we're going to talk about the uh, the Japanese HTV4 docked. Yes. <laughs> what, what is all that stuff? Sandy's just posted cats. Possessed cats. Soon. Soon. <laughs> On a geologic time scale. <laughs> what is happening? I looked away for two seconds. And the oh. demon cats have arrived. All right. Uh, oh, Shivang Gupta wants to know, uh, the magnetic fields flip in the sun cycle, isn't it almost at maximum? How can the fields flip now? That's actually why it's at maximum, because stuff is unstable magnetically on the sun. There you go. And there's there's a lot of discussion about when maximum actually is going to occur too. So we're it's kind of within a year or so they kind of yeah. have some idea when it's going to occur. Uh, okay, so we're going to move on to the Japanese HTV docking. And David, you've got yes. this one. HTV four launched from Japan, from the southern tip of Japan, uh, last Saturday on August third. A lot of amateurs have been actually tracking it. I saw it Sunday night when it passed over. Uh, I didn't see it paired with the ISS. Unfortunately, it was way behind the ISS at that time. But the other, uh, last night and the night before, some UK observers, and I believe some in the US caught it too uh, when it passed, and it was very close to the ISS. It's always neat to see them when they're paired like that. It, it, uh, it grappled in birth. Uh, I would accept docking too. Some people like to say grappled in birth. Uh, with the Canada the Arm 2, as a matter of fact, was the one that caught the HTV-4. That's how, along with the Dragon capsule, that's how they uh, actually do these. They grab them as they get up close, and then they docked it to the, or birthed it to the uh, Harmony node of the ISS. And it's going to be there until it undocks in September 4th is when it's actually going to undog. Now, HTV-4 just does a destructive re-entry when it comes back. The Dragon Capsule is the only one we have right now that can go up and be recovered and used again right now. Of all these, we've got the Cygnus module that's going to be going up pretty soon with the Antares rocket, with Orbital Sciences, 
We've got the progress module that can go up and down. We've got um, the Albert Einstein of the ATV a series of modules, so the ESA, they can go up and down. So we're getting a lot more capability now at the ISS. We still only have one ma one way to get humans up and down right now is by Soyuz. Soyuz yeah. so until the Dragon gets man rated or they get some other, the Orion gets on the pad and you know with MPCV. Speaking of future missions that may or may not happen, uh, why don't we move to Casey uh, and talk about the Maven? <laughs> this is going to happen. Is this, this going to happen? Because you you happen. are the guy that brings us all down. I'm the bummer. I know. Yeah. I'm just a constant bummer. <laughs> no, this is a good one. This is I can. This is un, un whole, uh, wholeheartedly. I should say wholeheartedly behind this. This is going to happen unless an engineer trips and falls headfirst with a cake into the Maven Electronics uh, at Kennedy Space Center. So uh, what we're talking about is the next mission to Mars. It's an orbiter. I mentioned this earlier. It's called Maven. It has an acronym that I'm forgetting right now but it's going to study the atmosphere of Mars, and it's going to try to figure out where the atmosphere went. Uh, Curiosity had some really cool findings that's actually not discussed as much, that they measured, they proved, looking at isotope relative concentrations, that the past atmosphere of Mars used to be much, much denser than it is now. That means the atmosphere was taken away. Maven's going to go and try to figure out how that happened and when it happened. So very cool science here. Uh, Maven is going to launch... The launch window opens November 18th, and what's interesting, that last week, it was built in Colorado by Lockheed Martin uh, near Boulder, and to get it from Colorado down to the Kennedy Space Center launch complex, they fly it on this big old Air Force C-17 monster plane, and it's very cool, and, and the cool thing, in which I love about Twitter, and I love about NASA on Twitter, is that the Maven to Mars Twitter account, the official account for the mission, tweeted its pictures the whole way over. It was very cool. So you got to see them loading this big box into the plane, flying out, pulling it out at Kennedy Space Center. And now they're doing the final checkout. They're attaching the solar panels. They just attached the big high-gain antenna onto the spacecraft. And they're, they're completing the entire thing to tuck it up, stick it inside the rocket, and it's going to launch uh, hopefully sometime in November. So this mission is almost done. It's actually been a fantastic mission. The budget has just been perfect. It has not gone over budget. It has been perfectly managed. It is just a great example of what NASA does best. More, please. <laughs> I, sent, I sent my haikus. Did you see yes. your haikus? Yeah, we yeah, yeah, story on that. haikus and names, um, and it will have a very small camera. It's not really an imaging mission. Um, it's a very specific. It used to be part of what was called the Mars Scout Program. So back when we had a more robust Mars exploration program, you had these series of low-cost missions. So Phoenix was an example of this. MAVEN was, is the last in this line of scout missions, so relatively low-cost, very specific science goals, so unlike Curiosity, Curiosity is about $2.5 billion, Maven is about $500 million. So much more pared down mission. But again, you're kind of hitting these, all these specific points of Mars scientific questions that we're going to solve. And that's, uh, that's the very exciting thing about Maven that we're looking forward to. So Maven to Mars on Twitter, it's a great account. Putting it together right now, you'll see the whole construction process online. Uh, I can't hear you. You're muted Sorry. again, okay. Fraser. Wah, wah. I'm so busy getting people to mute that, uh, you know, I never forget to unmute myself. Uh, or I whack my microphone, and that clearly it doesn't like that. Uh, okay, so the last story is the Delta launch. And, uh, David, was, you live uh, near this thing. Wednesday night, unfortunately, it was too cloudy to see it here from Tampa Bay. It was, uh, was the WGS-6 uh, launch. And this is kind of a page from my old military days because WGS-6 is actually an acronym of an acronym. It's Wideband Global SATCOM. So SATCOM is Satellite Communications. It's, it's a new series of Block 2 satellites. It was a classified launch. This is a military launch. Headed up to Geosync. It was an interesting one to watch. I watched most of it online. Like I said, you can see those kind of launches from here about 100 miles away. It was, a, it was too bad because it was, a, it was a launch at dusk, too, which is one of the coolest things to see because the sun angle is just right with the sun setting over the Gulf of Mexico. When, when they used to have shuttle launches and they launched at dusk, they were awesome to watch because you could see them for hundred, hundreds of miles away. And, like, you could see them from your house? Yes. Yep. You can see them. Uh, I, I have some really spectacular launch photos. I think it was STS-130, 131 was in the morning. And when it came up, it hit the sun, and it lit the whole contrail. It looked like a big flaming comet kind of in the sky. And I did a 20-second time exposure. Actually, it was running that Sky Telescope article I did. I was glad they, they picked that photo to go in there because it's, it's one of the cooler things I ever shot. 
But uh, but yeah, it's unfortunately these smaller rockets. Say I'm saying Delta Four is small. It's still the size of an apartment building. It's a pretty big rocket. But uh, compared to the shuttle, it's they're they're not quite as spectacular, but they're still cool to see. But the mission was utterly classified. You have no idea what it was carrying, what it was doing, apart from some well, secret the, military thing. The, I'm sure it was a, cl- too clouded to see it. it. It, it's it's one of those it, it's to enhance warfighting capabilities. I'm sure it's it's going to be uh, providing like uh, enhanced communications for like satellite drones and, and it's uh, watching us right now. Unmanned drones. It probably is. Don't, triples. Don't, yeah, don't 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 talk about it anymore. It's, it's end up triples. <laughs> yeah. That's the secret military. These, these sort these sort of things when you see them when they come up on NORAD on space they don't put them up on space track like the tracking elements. There's still amateurs that track them. But they don't actually post the tracking elements up there for these kind of satellites. So. Right. This With is where I always say that we have two space programs in the United States. One is really well funded, and the other one is NASA. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it's I, if you follow a lot of these launches too, it's like you see how many military launches go up for how many uh, science and exploration launches. It's really you get a sense of the of the disproportionate. I mean, we need both, obviously, but. It, it's really disproportionate. You real start to realize there's a lot of military launches going on. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think it's time to wrap this up. We're sort of closing in on an hour, so I'm going to give everyone a chance so people to find out more. Uh, Sandy, where do we find out more? Oh, you're muted. Always with the mute. You can find me at Twitter. I'm at Sandy, and I will be tweeting about things at Arecibo. And uh, if you want... An adorable little kitten, and you're located near Miami or San Francisco. Um, let me know. Send me a, a, an at tweet, and I will uh, I will get you to this little white kitten. She was born <laughs> underneath the radar at Arecibo, and there I have too many cats. Someone please take her. <laughs> but that's like a cat with special radar powers, right? She has special radar powers, and her mother was tiny, and her grandmother was tiny, so she'll probably be tiny. And you can she can kill radioactive spiders. She can. She can, you know, kill low noise amplifiers just by looking at them. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, Amy Sure Title. Where do we find out more? Um, you can visit my website at amysheertitle.com for links to my blog, Vintage Space, and my stuff. Um, all space history on Discovery News, Scientific American, Al Jazeera English, Motherboard Device. Um, Are you done other- anymore? <laughs> also, find me on Twitter and Google Plus and Facebook. Um, yeah. Go and and happy <laughs> Mars Curiosity anniversary, Amy. Yes, thank you. Still... And happy Mars Curiosity anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> there should be a better word for that, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's All right, hard. Casey. Where do we find out more? Uh, planetary.org is always a great place. Uh, have all of our blogs, my blog, Emily's blog, guest blogs about other cool space stuff. Planetary.org slash SOS if you want to find out how you can also be a space advocate and do something about making sure more missions happen in the future. Uh, You can find us on Twitter at Explore Planets and then Planetary Society, Facebook, Google+, all the good social uh, network sites. So check us out there. And take back that recommendation from the the fans that Emily should be uh, picked for... I will let her. I'll, I'll let associate her know. Director. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, t- I'll tell her to toss her hat into the ring. And yeah, I'm also, exactly. I just want to say that I'm wearing my Curiosity uh, Planet Fest, where we celebrated Curiosity's landing a year ago too. So we're all yeah. pro Curiosity here. That was that terrific. Was a crazy yeah. Crazy party. Yeah, that yeah. was great. <laughs> Two thousand people screaming at once is a pretty intense. Dressed <laughs> like Martians. Just yeah. Martians. <laughs> all right, David. Where do we find out more? I am AstroGuys with a Z on Twitter, and I have an article this morning that was uh, kind of proud of, of uh, the upcoming occultations of Spica, the next four cycles of daylight occultations. It's kind of uh, an interesting little challenge I threw out there for observers. Awesome. Uh, okay, great. And and also, David, you wrote like just the canonical Perseids 2013 observing guide. So if anyone's yes, looking for that, uh, by all means, do a search for David's name in Perseids, and I'm sure you'll find it. it is a terrific article. There's history, there's lore, there's audible meteors, there's everything you could yeah. ever imagine about yeah. like every every fact and fiction about meteor showers up there. Yeah, fantastic. Nicole Gallucci, where do we find out more? Uh, first, I have a couple announcements. Um, okay. First of all, I want to say happy birthday to Guido Bibra. Google Plus says it's your birthday. He is one of uh, he watches 
us every week and comments and post links. So happy Number one birthday, fan. Guido. Number one fan. Yes, ever since Hangouts on Air was available in Germany, he's been with us. Um, so first, happy birthday. Uh, second, um, Astrosphere New Media is looking for donations to keep up its media production of 365 Days of Astronomy and Astronomy Cast and all that good stuff, the forums. Uh, so if you can make a donation to Astrosphere New Media, they could really use the help to keep paying people to put out awesome media for you guys. This is separate from the CosmoQuest stuff. I am not an Astrosphere employee. I just, you know, <laughs> We're big fans. work on these things, and I'm a big fan. Uh, so yeah, so those are my two big announcements. Um, I'm Noisy Astronomer, noisyastronomer.com, anywhere on Twitter and Google+, and uh, I work for CosmoQuest, cosmoquest.org. Come do citizen science with us. And uh, just one reminder, again, if you want, subscribe to the channel wherever you are. I know we post these on my personal YouTube feed, but we also post them over on Astrosphere. So, mm -hmm. you know, and if you post, if you subscribe in either location, uh, you'll get all the other stuff that we're doing. So it will pop up on your feed whenever you go to YouTube. So I highly recommend. You should get notifications when we start recording, although apparently that's broken recently. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, the next thing we're going to do is the virtual star party on Sunday night, which is kind of strange because that's also when the proceeds start, so we'll do that, and then I'm going to go. So that's that. So thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this week. It was great, and we will see you all next week.